Uh, welcome to the Center for the Study of Global Change, Changes Global Positioning Series uh, on Resilient Global Cities. It is a three-part conversation taking place over the next couple months that matches the College of Arts and Sciences Master on Resilience. And so we're also thankful to the college for supporting us um, and, and promoting these, the series of events. And today we have um, Eli Friedman, who's Associate Professor in the Department of International and Comparative Labor and the Director of International Programs at the ILR School at Cornell University. Um, and he'll be talking, his talk is titled Rendered Surplus, The Struggle for Schooling Amidst Anti-Migrant Policies in Beijing. Uh, Professor Friedman's interests are China, development, education, social movements, urbanization, work, and labor. He currently has two major research streams, the first which looks at state responses to worker unrest in China and the development of labor relation institutions. And the second is a study of Chinese urbanization with a particular focus on access to education for rural to urban migrants. And so thank you so much uh, to Dr. Friedman for joining us. And then I'll also take a quick moment to promote the other two events in our series. And the next speaker is Professor Hallbrow, who will be talking about temporary migration and the making of ethnic inequality. She'll be joining us October 14th at noon. I'll share the link. We'll share the link to register for that talk. And then in November, on November 16th, also at noon, uh, Professor Daher from the uh, German Jordanian University will be joining us to talk about contesting neoliberal urban transformations, awareness building resistance and activism in Amman. So please join us um, for those two talks in October and November. Uh, Dr. Cohen shared the link to for more information about each of those talks and to register in the chat. As we go, you are welcome to use the chat feature to have a side conversations, uh, ask questions, and we'll have a robust Q&A portion at the end today. So thanks again for joining us, and I will turn it over uh, to Professor Friedman. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much, Eli. It's a, a real pleasure, and also wanted to um, thank Ellie and, and Hillary as well for, for organizing this. Um, I really appreciate the, the resiliency theme uh, that goes along with this lecture series. Um, and um, I should say that it's it's not how I framed my work up till now, but thinking about it kind of pushed me to, to, to rethink how the concept relates uh, to my own work. And I think it does um, quite a lot, in particular, thinking about how rural to urban uh, migrant workers in China deal with the pressures that are pushing them out of the city. And these pressures can be really overwhelming and requires, I think, quite a bit of, uh, of resiliency. And hopefully that'll come through in the talk today. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. <clears throat> um, OK, that looks OK to everyone. Great. Um, so let me uh, present a, uh, a bit uh, of an overview of the talk today, uh, which is called Rendered Surplus. I'm going to be presenting materials from a uh, forthcoming book I have called The Urbanization of People. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to share the cover art with you uh, that uh, just became public uh, a couple days ago, and so it now feels like it's actually uh, a book. Um, I can't address all of the components uh, of the book, but I do want to focus on two key sub-arguments that I present there. Um, the first is that urban governments in China are using various techniques to expel particularly working class people uh, from the city. This is a group of folks that they refer to as the low end population. Uh, and schools are a key site that they're using as a pressure point to remove people from the city. Um, and <clears throat> interestingly enough, they're deploying these kinds of tactics against people who are actually vital to the functioning of the economy. And I call this process, I, I refer to it as, as these people being rendered surplus. And I'll explain what that means and, and what that concept is doing for me. Uh, the second point uh, is to look at the coping mecha mechanisms and forms of social triage that happens when migrant children are ejected from the school system uh, in the city. Um, and this is the resiliency piece. Uh, and you know there is real heroism that's going on here, uh, but I should warn you, it is not always a happy story. So the story of my research begins in the summer of 2011 when I read news both in Chinese media and international media 
that more than two dozen schools for the children of migrant workers in the city of Beijing were being demolished just a few weeks before the beginning uh, of the school year, leaving uh, perhaps tens of thousands of families scrambling for a place uh, to, to enroll their children. Um, and uh, this was pretty dramatic. In my earlier research, which focused more on, on labor politics within the workplace, uh, I'd often talk to workers, migrant workers, about challenges that they faced in terms of getting their children into schools in the cities they, they worked. Um, but this was, this was really seemed to me like some sort of an escalation. And so I went to Beijing uh, that winter um, in December 2011 uh, and then into 2012, and I began poking around. Now, before I go any further, I wanna provide a couple of definitions just to make sure that we're all on the same page here. When I'm talking about, excuse me, when I'm talking about migrant workers uh, in the Chinese context, uh, I'm not talking about international migrants as might be the case in the United States. Migrant worker in China refers to people who are PRC citizens, but who are rural to urban migrants. And for all sorts of reasons that we'll discuss in a minute, they are excluded from the full benefits of citizenship once they leave their place of official registration. So that's what I'm talking about with respect to migrant workers. And migrant schools are schools in these cities uh, that serve the children of those migrant workers. They are largely or completely privatized, oftentimes re receiving no subsidies from the state. They serve largely, but basically exclusively non-local students. And uh, as you can see from this image, they are badly uh, under-resourced because they are private schools that serve poor and working class people who do not have the resources to buy high quality education. So um, again, going back to the winter of 2011, 2012, uh, I began doing this research. And over the next several years, what I found was that the municipal government in the city of Beijing was using all sorts of shifts in administrative rules, bureaucratic rules to slowly deprive migrants from access to education. And this was true both for the formal and state subsidized public education, as well as these informal uh, and private migrant schools. Both of the, these options were being slowly squeezed. Interestingly enough, at the same time, again, 2011 to 2014, the central government, which is distinguished from the Beijing city government, I just wanna make that clear because Beijing is the capital, can be a little confusing here, but the central government begins advancing this concept of the urbanization of people. And so this title that I have for my book, The Urbanization of People, is actually part of the official discourse. And the idea with the urbanization of people from the state's perspective is they, they want more people to move to cities. And this is historically novel. This has never happened in the history of the People's Republic, which has mostly been uh, oriented towards <clears throat> preventing people uh, from moving from uh, the countryside uh, into cities. <clears throat> but th this is not just a sort of, uh, you know, official Communist Party jargon. It's actually conceptually significant for me because what I see in this term, the urbanization of people, is an implicit, implicit acknowledgement that there's a disjuncture between the urbanization of, on the one hand, capital and labor, that the economy is overwhel overwhelmingly urban, that people are overwhelmingly working in urban spaces. And on the other hand, people, which is to say human beings and all of their various social needs, including critically, of course, education for their children. So why does the central government make this shift around, it's really around 2013, but it's, it's formalized in 2014 towards wanting to facilitate urbanization? Well, they believe that it will be useful in helping China to rebalance their economy over the reform period from the 1980s up until then, China had become a very unequal place, both in terms of class terms and also regional terms with cities uh, dominating against the countryside. It had also become very dependent on uh, foreign consumers. You have this export led um, model of, of growth and with slowing growth in the United States, Europe uh, and Japan, they became, they became nervous about that kind of dependency. And you can see here I think this is the only uh, sort of economics chart that I'm going to show you, so don't, don't worry if numbers are tough for you. Uh, but if you look at household uh, final consumption as an expenditure of GDP, you can see that it's declining over the course of the reform era when, when China is undergoing these market, this market transformation. And if you include this uh, domestic consumption in relationship to other countries, including other Asian tiger countries like 
uh, South Korea and Taiwan, China is, is much below, much, is way, way below where, where some of these other countries are. So they want more domestic consumption and they want more equal forms of consumption where Chinese people, Chinese workers themselves have more money to spend. And that can become, this is sort of a Keynesian idea about how to, how to uh, orient the economy, move away from that kind of neoliberal export oriented model that they had developed <clears throat> over the previous generation. Um, but in order to do this, they, the, the central state believes that you need to have more urbanization to do this. The idea is that people who are living in cities consume more, which is true, that as producers, they produce more efficiently than people uh, in, in rural areas. The issue is that there have been a lot of people moving to China's cities over the previous generation, but about 300 million of them are living outside their place of official registration, of official household registration. And I'll talk about the significance of that in just a second. So what that means is the, the sort of the, the most important thing for us to understand right now is that it means they can't access social services. So what this means is that capital has been urbanized. Again, you have an urban economy. Labor is urbanized in the sense that there are labor markets who are free to come into cities and you know, try to get a job. Um, but people are not urbanized as full social beings. And so migrants inclusion into urban space is highly segmented, included as workers and facing obstacles as full people. So we have this national urbanization plan and subsequently in 2014, there's a residency reform plan. And again, this is the first time they're encouraging people to move to the cities. The media, state media is talking about a new openness to migrants wanting them to come to the cities. And of course this did not comport at all with what I, with what I had been seeing in Beijing the previous years where we see both administrative movements to get people out and more coercive interventions as with the school demolitions. And the issue is this, the central government wants certain kinds of people in certain kinds of cities. And the, the, the somewhat crude shorthand that I use to think about this is that they want elite cities for elite people and they want low end cities for the so-called low end people. And there are big scare quotes around uh, all of these terms, of course. They say quite explicitly in these plans that cities with an urban population of 5 million or more are supposed to strictly control their population growth. And the smaller the city, the fewer the restrictions there are on people relocating and getting local urban citizenship. There have been some more recent reforms in 2019 that abolish the distinction between rural and urban forms of residency and are encouraging liberalization in somewhat larger cities than had been the case in 2014. But this doesn't change the basic underlying dynamic in, in the largest cities, which not coincidentally are also the recipients of the largest number of migrants. So this all raised a number of questions for me, which are structured the research. Who gets into which cities and why? What happens to people who are living in cities where they aren't supposed to be? In short, how do Chinese megacities manage flows of people into their space? And what are the political and social consequences of that particular approach? Um, I'm not gonna, since this is an interdisciplinary group, I won't bore you too much with my methods, um, but I did more than 250 interviews in four different cities uh, in China. I did extensive ethnographic research in, in schools in three of those cities. Um, the book mostly focuses on Beijing and that's, the, that's what I'm gonna uh, talk about today. And Beijing is a weird city in a lot of ways, uh, but it's also super important. Um, so not making any claims about representativeness, but there, there's immense political significance for viewing this regime from the perspective uh, of, of the capital city. Um, and during Q&A, if folks are interested, I'm, I'm happy to get into my reasoning for, for choosing this site, as well as how I selected schools, specific schools to, to study. Now, before I get into the empirics, I want to do a brief conceptual overview to clarify what I mean by this term rendered surplus. So going back to those 2011 school demolitions that I saw, I was seeing this and trying, not seeing it firsthand, I was reading about it and, and trying to make sense uh, of what was going on here and began looking to the literature on urbanization uh, in the global South. And one of the things that I saw in this literature was a lot of attention to what people call surplus populations. So what is a surplus population? Well, here's a classic, definition, which comes from Karl Marx, who, who originated 
well, he didn't actually originate the term. He's responding to some extent to what Thomas Malthus had said. Uh, but most people are drawing directly on Marx. And he says it's a population which is superfluous to capital's average requirements for its own valorization and is therefore a surplus population. Um, and this understanding of it more or less persists for scholars up until now and some prominent people such as Mike Davis, Tanya Lee uh, and others are more or less concerned with the population's utility to capital. Does it have some sort of usefulness from the perspective of capitalists? And the basic story that we see, again, Mike Davis, Tanya Lee and others saying is that <clears throat> if you look at the global South today, you have millions of people <clears throat> in agrarian or other kind of non-capitalist or sort of marginally capitalist living arrangements who are being dispossessed of their, of their land and forced to move into the cities <clears throat> with no possibility of finding adequate wage labor to sustain themselves. A simpler way to think about this is that capitalists want their land, but not their labor. And so you have this kind of mass, this accumulation of, of surplus populations and, and slums and, and all the rest that are developing in cities in the global south. So I love a lot of this work, I'm very inspired by it, but empirically does not account for what I'm seeing happening in Beijing. Because if we look at these migrant school demolitions and subsequent initiatives taken by the city in Beijing and other cities, um, including mass demolition of migrant housing, the state is oftentimes targeting people who were gainfully employed and in fact played a critical role in sustaining the city's economy. And so it, it's a little bit puzzling, right? This, this theory of the surplus population as we see it uh, in other works doesn't really account for this. So I do a whole theoretical reconstruction of this concept of surplus population via a dialogue with Foucauldian biopolitics. I'm not going to bore you with the details of that here, but the essential point is to critique the idea that when engaging in empirical research, we can determine what it means for a person or a group of people to be useful for, for capital. Instead, I focus on the division between people who get access to various kinds of life-sustaining infrastructure, such as critically healthcare, education, and housing, and people who are excluded from that. And the idea of being then rendered surplus is this, that people are not surplus by dint of their structurally, structurally determined position in the economy or the relationship to wage labor. In the case in Beijing, we see state intervention that produces people as surplus. It extracts them from their current economic activity which again is, is useful for their bosses, is necessary for their bosses, and engages in life-denying forms of interventions. It basically adds a kind of a political agency uh, as well as contestation into the analysis of how populations are managed. Okay, that's enough of the, the sort of the conceptual stuff. I just wanted to clarify what I meant by um, rendered surplus, and now we can turn back to the empirical material. So the question, another way of phrasing the, the question that I wanna ask is how does this state optimize the population? And again, this is the language that we see urban governments using. They wanna optimize their urban population structure. And it's important to once again emphasize here that I'm talking about the extra large cities in China, the so-called cities that, uh, so-called extra large cities that have a population of more than 5 million people. Um, in both official documents and in and media reporting, these cities are quite explicit that they want to attract uh, what they refer to as elite talent while having little regard for maintaining uh, the low end populations. And so the optimization of the population is imagined as necessary to catalyze the next phase of development that they're undergoing now, moving from labor intensive forms of industry that are predicated on cheap labor to high value added uh, high value added forms of production, the construction of these globally competitive corporations. And of course we see the United States and China sort of going head to head over, uh, you know, who's going to dominate the future of all kinds of high value added forms of, of technological production. Another piece of this, which is very important is they wanna bring in high value producing forms of labor in order to be able to sustain and to fiscally prop up a rapidly aging urban population because the cities themselves are, are, are aging quite quickly. There's quite low birth rates. So I'm using schooling here as a lens on a broader process of urbanization. And there's other 
perspectives from which one could study it, but I think that schooling is, is significant for um, a number of reasons, most importantly, because it helps us get at this kind of intergenerational processes and the question of permanent resettlement in, in, in urban areas in a way that housing or even healthcare doesn't quite get at, right? If you're interested in, are these people becoming urban residents long-term, schooling is a really, is a really good place um, to observe that. So the, the, the key empirical question for me is, how do migrants get access to education when, when they're in the city? And the, the short answer is that it is very difficult in Beijing, and it is particularly difficult now and has become more so over the last um, decade or two. As people may be aware, the Chinese state has more tools at their disposal to control the internal movement of their own, citizen, sin, uh, their own citizenry than just about any other country. And the key institution that the state uses to manage internal movement is the hukou. Now the hukou is the household registration system. It's an institution that ties the provision of social services to particular locations. And if you leave your place of official registration and you go somewhere else, you may be able to access those services, but the state is not obligated to provide the services to you. They can be extended to you on, on, a, on a contingent basis. So in answering the question for a migrant that shows up in Beijing, will they be able to get their child into a public school? The first question is, will they be able to get hukou? In other words, will you be able to become a full urban citizen and have this more or less legal guarantee that you will have access to social services? Which I just want to footnote and say, this doesn't mean that everybody who's a Beijing resident and has Beijing hukou is getting access to wonderful, totally equal forms of, of services. That's another story. But I'm just looking at this, at this hukou versus not hukou form of division to begin with. Getting access to hukou has increasingly come to be governed by something that's referred to as point-based HUCO acquisition. And these schemes are relatively new, but I think it's just a systematization of a pretty deeply ingrained political logic that has existed for a long time. Anyone who's familiar with uh, immigration plans that they have in, in countries like Canada, Canada, also, Canada kind of innovated this point-based um, system. Of course, that's for international migrants and Chinese cities are now using it to, to, to manage internal movement. So how do you go about accumulating points for to get a Beijing I'm just going to run through a couple of the key issues. I, I, the first and most important in Beijing and every other city is their assessment of your labor market value. And the basic labor market orientation of these point-based plans is reflected in an opinion issued by the state council, which is a central government institution in 2014, that kind of laid the ground rules for these point-based um, citizenship plans. And it said that cities should, quote, emphasize resolving hukou, meaning providing hukou, for people who have been in the city for a long time, have strong employability, and can adapt to urban industrial transformation and upgrading, and the competitive urban environment. So uh, if we look specifically at Beijing, one of the four primary considerations in their point-based hukou acquisition plan is quote, ensuring the human resources to improve the central functions of the capital city. So concretely, all of these plans require a, a labor contract. So you get a certain number of points for having a labor contract. Education level is, is also critical in basically all of these point-based plans. So if you have you know, primary schooling, you get zero points. The higher the education you have, the more points you accumulate, oftentimes up until including graduate education. Many cities will have lists of specific skills that they've determined to be in high need within their regional labor market at, at some time. So, you know, maybe this year it's welders and next year it's, you know, programmers or, or, or what have you. And, and these are sort of dynamic shifting things that vary in different parts of the city, uh, sorry, different parts of the country, dependent on, uh, on a variety of factors. Uh, and they generally will, in Beijing and in other cities, will not accept people who are over uh, 45, given the, the relatively short uh, time frame that they have left to be uh, in the labor market. Other cities will allow you to apply after 45, but you get point demerits for every you know, additional year. Uh, the next most important thing is owning property. Um, so you need to provide proof of formal housing within the city. Owning house, owning house will allow you to accumulate points. 
Many cities will allow you to accumulate some points for renting, but there is always a, a disparity uh, between owning versus a renting. And if you're living again in a, in a informal housing situation, uh, if you're living in employer provided dormitories, uh, as is true for you know, construction workers and a lot of factory workers, then, uh, then you accumulate no points. Another important metric uh, in Beijing and other places is the contribution to the local tax base. So in the city of Beijing, in order to be able to just apply, this is no guarantee that you will get it, but in order to apply, you have to, be, you have, to have paid into the local social insurance plan for seven years. Other cities uh, will give you more points for the more years that you've paid into social insurance. Other, in, in, in some cities, they count contributions to, to income tax or to corporate tax. And it's kind of the more money that you've paid into the tax system, the more points that you can uh, accrue. And the last general category um, by which you can accumulate points, or in this case, really lose points is political correctness. This, this is my term, this is not an official term. Um, so if you have legal violations of violations of the birth control uh, policy, um, you can get point deductions. Certainly, you know, participating in any banned political activities um, it will, will invalidate your application. Now, if we look at these, I, I just want to quickly run through each of these metrics and show how they systematically discriminate against poor and working class people. And I think that that should be pretty, pretty clear. If we look at the, the labor market value, um, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of migrant workers in China have no labor contract um, because that's just kind of how the, the labor market is structured. It's true in many places in the developing world. And so without a labor contract, you're at the outset excluded. Obviously, the higher the education you have, the more points you accrue, uh, that, that discriminates against people who only have uh, a primary education. China has nine years compulsory education. Um, and for most rural to urban migrants, um, nine years of education is likely what they're, all they're going to have. Some have a little bit more technical, um, technical school training. Um, when it comes to owning property, that is straightforward, that it, it's a, a sort of class discriminatory. Uh, China's uh, urban property markets are famously uh, expensive, uh, and uh, the income to, to real estate price ratios are, are badly skewed, you know, much worse than, um, than the United States or other countries in East Asia. Um, similarly, with, with contributing to the local tax base, um, if you're an informal worker, you're not allowed to participate in social insurance. Lots of workers who actually do have labor contracts would like to participate in social insurance, but if their employer doesn't agree to it, um, then you know then they, they can't do that. Uh, I forgot to mention with respect to owning property, the, the prevalence of informal housing, which for vast swaths of the of the migrant labor workforce is the only form of housing that they can uh, afford. And if you don't have a deed or uh, or a rental lease, um, then you're also ex excluded at the outset from these plans. Um, and then political correctness is, is a little bit different, but um, you know, if you, violations of the birth control policy can be overcome if you pay a certain fine, if you don't have the money to pay that fine, that's, you know, that's a strike against you. So in general, the more economic capital and cultural capital that an applicant has, the more likely they are to be able to get HUCO and therefore access social services in the city. So it's important to note here that HUCO and the citizenship regime more broadly it's not just about exclusion, as it sometimes gets, gets talked about, uh, even in the academic literature. It's not just for keeping people out. It's a means for bringing in certain kinds of people and to, to use the official language to optimize the structure of the population. And we can see that megacities, including Beijing and Shanghai and, and other places in 2017 began giving what they refer to as green card, which is a program to recruit um, people globally they call them global talents and provide access to social services within the city. And this is happening at precisely the same time that they're expelling hundreds of thousands of the so-called low-end population from urban space. Okay, so that's, that's the HUCO, right? If you want guaranteed access to social services, you gotta get a HUCO. But as I said already, if you don't have local HUCO, you can still apply to get your child into public schools. Again, it's not guaranteed, but you may be granted contingent access. So if you don't have HUCO, how do you go about trying to get your child into a public school? And what we see is there's a very similar set of requirements, the ones that I've just described for applying to HUCO. There's a lot of national variation, which I think is, is interesting. Some places have point-based school enrollment plans, 
similar to the ones that I've just uh, described or parents apply, you accumulate a certain set of points. If you get to some cutoff, you can then submit an application uh, and they then disperse <clears throat> positions within the school based on that. Beijing does not have one of those, one of these uh, point-based school enrollments. Those are more prevalent in Guangdong province and elsewhere in the South. Beijing has had something, uh, it's changed just in the last year, but uh, has had something called the five permits in order to apply for public schools. So the five permits are, you have to produce a labor contract, you have to provide proof of social insurance, you have to provide a rental lease or a deed to a house, you have to provide your huko. And the last piece of documentation is a little bit curious, but you have to provide proof that there is nobody in your home, <clears throat> in your home village who can look after the child. From a logical standpoint, of course, you can't prove a negative, but what it means practically is you have to go back to your village and you have to pay someone in the village a bribe in order to give you a sort of documentation to sign off on this documentation. Um, and so once again, we can see that it serves to exclude the most vulnerable, the lower tiers of the labor market. Lots of people who don't have labor contracts, who don't have social insurance, who don't have formal housing are immediately excluded. And then I should also, also mention that particularly from 2014 on, when access to public schools is becoming more restricted, all kinds of reports that I, I and others have documented showing that departments of education would arbitrarily add other kinds of requirements if people were able to meet those formally stated requirements. There's one great piece of investigative journalism that documented 36 other forms uh, of documentation that departments of education had asked of people once they had met the, the stated requirements. So let's say you can provide social insurance for the past year, and then you go back and they say, well, no, actually, we, now we need social insurance for the past five years. And they'll just continue to do that until the person sort of gives up. So just to recap, we have two layers of what I think of as a negative means test. That's kind of the inverse logic of a means test for accessing public services. The first is the question of will you get HUCO or not? And if not, which the overwhelming majority of people not, will not, right? Only a few thousand people in Beijing each year are getting uh, who go through these channels. The question is, can you get provisional access to public schools? Um, and so what we see in each of these is that this public resource of education is going to people who need it the least and that everybody else is left to a lightly regulated or completely unregulated free market for education. The result of this is that these migrant schools, which is where I did most of my uh, field work, I also went to some public schools as, as points of comparison, but the migrant schools are what I think of as spaces of concentrated deprivation, right? The most deprived are concentrated in those schools and that anyone who gets out who can access the public schools will do so. And that includes both students as well as teachers. Teachers who can get hired by public schools always will do so because it's, it's, it's a much better job. So the question uh, then becomes what happens to families who cannot get into public schools? And the, the, the first answer is that they're gonna to go to private schools. Uh, for most my working class migrants, um, these will be informal uh, and they don't have official registration. This is in the city of Beijing. Other places are a little bit different. And there's two ways that these schools kind of get talked about. And this is a bit of a, a simplification, but some people talk about them as uh, kind of community-based mutual aid. It's solidaristic action in the face of a, of a hostile state. Um, the other way to think about it is that this is neoliberal brutality, right? We have this unregulated market and rapacious business practices of these privately run schools, um, and they're preying on, on, on kind of the least well-resourced. And there's elements, of, in my view, there's elements of truth to both of these things. You know, people are doing the best they can in the unfortunate circumstances, and some schools are unregulated and, and engage in unscrupulous labor practices and, and various other kinds of bad practices. Um, nonetheless, nobody thinks that this is an ideal situation, right? And I just wanna highlight a couple of the main problems here. The first is that you have unprepared staff. Most of the teachers in these migrant schools in Beijing are unlicensed and they're not trained to be teachers. They are teaching subjects that they're not adequately equipped for, even if many of them are also very dedicated uh, you know, and altruistic, um, they're, they're simply not adequately prepared uh, for, uh, for, for teaching. Um, there's poor physical plant. As you can see in this image, uh, there's a big pile of coal 
uh, in the middle of the courtyard, which children were playing in. It's also an indicator that there, there is an indoor heat in Beijing, which is uh, a city that's, you know, it's cold, it snows in the winter, right? So they need indoor heat and they're burning coal. Um, there's also not indoor bathrooms. They have to go to a, to a outdoor space uh, to use bathrooms. There's no air conditioning. Um, many of them have uh, asbestos um, uh, in the buildings and they're, they're generally not a, a healthy environment. Um, and then finally, there's the extremely high turnover. And this is true both for students and teachers. It was the norm to have at least a third uh, of both students and teachers leave every year. Some schools had even higher turnover. And so it's this, this student population uh, and, and teacher population that's kind of in constant flux, right? For all sorts of reasons that have to do with what's happening within the school as well as things that are happening in the broader environment. <clears throat> Um, and the, uh, an additional problem that I've already um, hinted at is, of course, the school demolitions. Um, and this is a, a demolished school that, that I went to visit when I was doing my field work. In Beijing, there were 300 migrant schools, roughly, in 2006. By 2016, that number had been reduced to 112. In some cases, they're being demolished uh, because the state wants because the local government wants the land. Beijing, of course, is rapidly increasing land values and they just want to redevelop it. They don't see the, the, these schools as contributing, as contributing value to the city. And so they push them out and they build a high rise or, or what have you. That's what was happening in this case. In other cases, they're more, ex, more explicitly about uh, sort of population control. But if we look at this period from the mid 2000s up to the present, both of these pressures, the rising land values, as well as the population control pressures, are pushing in the same direction, which is to have fewer of these migrant schools in the city. From the perspective of students and families, it goes without saying that having your school demolished causes massive disruption. Um, Ellie and I were just talking uh, before the talk about uh, uh, you know COVID and and having children uh, at this time. I have a two year old and a four year old, and you know having my kid out of school for ten days because of a COVID situation, like I felt like my life was completely upside down and you know, my partner and I were on the verge of collapse. So this, this is a, clearly a much more a severe kind of a situation. So, and so, so what we see over the course of this period of time from the mid 2000s over the course of the next generation is a simultaneous movement on the part of the municipal government in Beijing to both raise the bar for access to public schools while making it harder and harder for these informal schools to exist. This is a strategy that they refer to as using education to control the population. That's, that's their terminology. Um, and it's been quite effective. So if we look at population grow growth in Beijing, we can see steady decline from 2008 to 2016. Between 2017 and 2018, the city lost an astonishing 165,000 people. That's in absolute terms. People, the, the population is smaller by 165,000. Now, obviously this is not just because of their education policy. There's all kinds of other pressure points that the state has been utilizing, demolishing housing, closing labor intensive forms of industry that are within the city. There's also the demographic patterns of decline in birth rate of the sort of native population. So I'm not making a claim that this, that one caused the other. But education is one important front in this overall population management regime. So what happens when, when you get ejected? One possibility is that the whole family says, well, we can't sustain things in Beijing anymore. We're going to go back to the village. Um, and there's a lot of variation here about how families make these decisions. Um, but it's rarely a simple proposition. And here's just one quote uh, from a parent that I interviewed. Uh, and they said, back home, there's no work. We're used to things here. We're not used to things back home. At the end of the day, it's already been so long. I, I believe this person had been in Beijing for 20 years. Um, we aren't used to things back there. If we go back, I don't even know how to farm, which crops to plant in which seasons. I've learned technical work. There isn't this kind of work back home. So obviously it, it, it is complicated to just go back to your HUCO registration location. Another possibility is you send the child home without the parents or with just one of the parents. Maybe they'll be looked after by grandparents or other kind of extended family. There's clearly social uh, and, and psychological costs um, to that. Um, this also, as you can imagine, causes some stress within families. So this is uh, another migrant parent says, if I send my youngest home this year, next year we'll, we'll still, well, this year we'll send one home and the next year send another one home. This would just cause me too much worry. 
Since they've never left me, I just don't know what to do. They've never left me, so I'm so worried. What we see here is the production of what's referred to in China as the left behind uh, children. These are children who, as a result uh, of migration, are either living with neither of their parents or just one of their parents, assuming that the other parent is, you know, is, is still alive. Um, and so you can see that this, this constitutes tens of millions of people. And what we can see is that it's urban policy that is producing these left behind children, right? This, these are sort of decisions that people have to make in response to changes in, in what's going on in cities. Um, there's, of course, uh, another possibility, um, which is that you could just move to another city, right? Pick up, move to some of the exur exurbs in, say, Hebei province, which is outside of Beijing, try to move to yet another city that has somewhat less restrictive policies. And what this leads to is this idea of continuously starting over. And this is really the, the, the resiliency piece, I think, the sort of clearest connection to this idea of resiliency. So this is um, actually interviewed a, a grandparent um, who said, uh, the demolition of our school, they knew their school was going to be demolished, but they didn't know when. It will happen sooner or later. We just don't know when, but we're definitely going to lose out. We'll have to go to a strange place and start over once more. Us outsiders, meaning migrants, our survival skills are quite strong. We are continuously starting over. Um, so that for me really, really captured the kind of the strain, but also the sort of the, the extent to which people just been kind of accustomed um, to this to this lifestyle. So this is the sort of broad range of possibilities of what to do when you're pushed out of the city. And the decisions, of course, um, are the, um, are shaped by myriad factors, including the number of children you have, their parents' position in the labor markets, the educational resources in the, in the village, the labor market opportunities back in the village, et cetera. But th this is kind of the, the general, general range. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, so just as way of concluding, the central government uh, has been uh, encouraging people to be urbanized, which is to say that they should be able to access social services in the places where they work. Beijing and other mega cities have been accepted from this though and instead are trying to selectively pull in what they refer to as elite talents. And they're using access to public education as a carrot to attract these talents. People who are not considered adequately talent are subjected to the whims of the market and generally precarious education and social reproduction more broadly. And the possibilities of surviving in these institutional interstices um, are becoming increasingly tenuous over the last 10 years. In short, the people who are most in need of social protections from the state are also the ones who are least likely to receive it. But ejecting people from the city remains actually in the realm of complete fantasy. You can't do it, right? The city depends on them. So yes, you know, population control does cause immense collateral damage in the lives of the most vulnerable people, but you can't have a city exclusively populated by finance managers and tech entrepreneurs and in the case of Beijing, professors, right? This is not possible. So these expulsions are not the end of the story. Um, and in fact, we see a really astonishing discursive reversal happening in China over the last few years. If you go back five or 10 years ago, the idea that you would hear in Chinese cities was China has too many people, right? We're overwhelmed. And that's why we have this draconian intervention into people's biological reproduction to prevent them from having more children. And now it's the complete opposite. Right? It's China doesn't have enough people. We're aging and we need, we need to power the labor market. So what are we gonna do here? Uh, and uh, and you know, that's playing out at the national level, but there's similar dynamics at play uh, in the at the level of this. Okay, I'm basically done. The, the, the final point that I wanted to conclude on was that there are forms of resistance. I had a, a photo, which I'll, I'll just save, uh, but there's general recognition that this is a problem among parents, uh, among teachers, and, and to some extent among policymakers. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, will call, it will require a, a significant pol a, a political realignment in order to be able to address these problems, but there are forms of even sort of bottom-up protests that are happening among, among people who, who are affected by it. So I think that, you know, this sort of, at a minimum, this, this recognition of the problem is an optimistic, uh, optimistic first step. So I'll leave it at that, and we still have a few minutes, I think, for, for discussion. So thanks, every thanks everyone. Yes, we have some time for discussion. And um, Sarah, you had a beautifully scripted question in the chat and, and it is lost. So if you wouldn't mind just posing that out loud, we can start with that one. Okay. Hi, Eli. It's nice to see you. Um, 
so yeah, I, I, I asked a question actually about um, how much are usual explanatory metrics of HUCO access and access to public education are continuing as the dominant factors driving the exclusion of migrant children from access to um, a decent education. Um, because what I'm seeing also is the government's increasingly restrictive policies regarding any kind of non-regulated education in China. And that affects elite families that are seeking Waldorf homeschooling, et cetera, for their children, as much as it affects disadvantaged migrant families. So I think that's another trajectory that is also influencing this. So that's one question. And then you just said something that really sparked my interest, which is also how do we begin to think about what kind of diverse population a city needs to survive? And as you said, a city can't survive on tech executives and all these other folks, right? They need the people who are gonna do the work of making everyday life possible. And those people are not willing to do that work. So how do government, urban officials and urban planners in China, are they thinking differently about this question of what kind of population we need to make our cities not only function, but also livable? So I realize those are two very different questions. I apologize. They are. They're, they're two wonderful questions, though. Um, and you know, the, the answer to the first question, I, I, I oftentimes worry that people will think I'm this like, you know, do or die, like hookah is the only thing that matters. And, and I don't, I, I really don't think that. And, and in the book, I deal with that in, in, in a lot more nuance and it's presented here. I think that the, the, the sort of the presentation of HUCO and requirements gives some indication to the logic of governance, but not necessarily the sort of the, the empirical outcomes with respect to, um, you know, class difference and, and all the rest. So um, yes, restrictions on private education, as we've seen very clearly just in the last couple of months, there's been this huge crackdown on elite, uh, elite level private education. And I think this is part of the broader uh, sort of impetus on the part of the state uh, you know, to resort control over various spheres of, of social life, including, including certainly schools. But you know, one way to think about this, and this is a debate going back, I think to the nineties about how much um, uh, inequality is accounted for by the traditional sort of state socialist forms of status as opposed to you know kind of market-based class differentiation as in most capitalist societies and and my answer is basically it's both and one, one way that you can look at this is that they've been moving towards uh, what's called place-based um, uh, catchment-based school enrollments so if you're in the city of Beijing and, and other cities now it's not the old system where if you had the right, you know, guanxi and you um, or your, your parents were in the right sort of political uh, downway, you know, unit, I, I can only think of the Chinese terms, but you know what I'm talking about, um, that you could get into the right school, right? And now they're focusing on this, this sort of catchment based form. And immediately when they implemented this policy, what you saw, not surprisingly, is that the areas around the elite schools, the real estate went up, right? And so they're moving in this more kind of American direction where you have sorting that's based that's sort of mediated by the real estate market rather than by this kind of state socialist institution of HUCO. That being said, HUCO is still there, right? And so if you don't have, you need both the sort of the economic wealth to be able to buy a house in those catchment areas and you need the HUCO in order to be able to get into the school. And also if you need to get access to credit, that's also mediated all by, by HUCO. So both of these things are happening at the same time. And I do think that you will see tensions as you have very wealthy people who still face obstacles based on HUCO, who are continuing to be excluded from the system, but then also locals who are finding increasingly that without, you know, that being a Beijing local that is getting sort of diminishing returns, that you also need to be able to buy a house. So the answer is, you know, the, the simple and probably unsatisfying answer is both of these things are happening. With respect to the question about what, what kinds of uh, diverse populations does the city need to survive? I mean, we should be very clear that this is a problem that is not unique to the city of Beijing, right? I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, I, I went to Berkeley, I lived in the Bay Area for a long time. If you look at what's happening there, they also own San Francisco want a city populated entirely by tech executives, right? And what that means is that the city has become basically unlivable for poor and working class people who clean the buildings and take care of the kids and the restaurants and, and all the rest. Um, and so 
both in a place like the Bay Area or New York, New York City or, or, or Beijing, what that means is those, those folks have just been sort of, there's these, these um, you know, centripetal pressures that are kind of pushing them outwards, right? It extends, it, it extends commuting time, uh, it, it, it extends, um, it extends uh, it, it makes the sort of organizing their social, their own social reproduction a lot more complicated, right? And so the pressures are kind of pushed downwards. And the question is kind of what's what's the breaking point? At what point can you no longer recruit the labor that you need in order to be able to provide the services that the that you know the rich and wealthy people want? I mean, in the United States, we might be at sort of that point, right? You can't fill jobs in the service sector anymore. I don't think that in, in Beijing, they have some sort of more interesting or advanced way of thinking about it. I think it is absolutely uh, a similar problem sorts of there. And looking at commute times, I think is one sort of rough way that you can, you can estimate that, that problem. Um, yeah. I think I, have, um, I see uh, Charmaine has a question in the chat and then Hillary has her uh, virtual hand raised. So I think we'll do Charmaine's question and then and then um, get Hillary next. And Charmaine asks, did you interview any of the children? And if you did, what did they say? Yeah, I talk a lot about this in the book, in the methods section. So I made a decision to not include children in the data. And I thought a lot about this. I, I, I talked to a lot of children, but I decided not to include them in, in sort of the data or to concretely uh, or, or specifically try to organize interviews with them. And that was basically an ethical decision that I made um, because I could not, I know that there are ethical ways to interview children and I could not come to terms with it for myself. And I think that the social distance between the child of a working class migrant in Beijing and myself as a white man, you know, relatively wealthy from, you know, a, a fancy university in the United States I just like couldn't come to terms with myself with with myself for for like what that would imply and particularly because I wanted to talk to them about traumatic things like tell me about when your school was demolished like how did that make you feel so I, I just didn't want to ask those kinds of questions and the the anxiety that I have about this which is coming out now is that people will sort of come to the conclusion that I think children's voices don't matter which is you know far from the case so what I did do as a way of sort of getting around this, if children talked to me, I, I listened, of course, and, and I would have informal conversations that I don't present in the, in the book, um, but it definitely informed the way I think about it. Um, and I would talk to parents. And you know, when I talk to parents, I'm also not going out of my way to sort of re-traumatize them or their families, but parents were oftentimes very eager and, and, and interested in, in bringing up these challenges. And so they would talk a lot about sort of their perspective on what it means. And of course, parents' perspectives on how their children are feeling and children's perspective on how they're feeling themselves are not the same. It's a shortcoming. Um, but you know, the, the sort of the short answer is there are deep emotional scars for a lot of these children. There are psychologists who have done research that I cite that show the effects of constant mobility, that show the effects of cycling between urban and rural spaces, of living you know, in nuclear family arrangements, in living in extended family arrangements, or in some cases, children living on their own once they get to be a little bit older. So, you know, the, the consequences are more or less what you would imagine them to be. I'll go ahead and ask my question. Um, so I have a lot of questions, but I'm, there's just three minutes left. So I'll, I'll limit myself to one. Um, which is about your model of how it's actually the state that is rendering surplus labor. And I'm wondering to what extent you see that as specific to the Chinese context and that you know China is an authoritarian state, it perhaps has more um, ability to directly render surplus than governments in democratic societies. Uh, but I can also see it like, even if capital is rendering surplus in other contexts, it's ultimately the state that is permitting capital to do that. Um, so I guess I just wondered if you had other examples of how the state might be rendering surplus or not um, in other contexts as well. Absolutely, yeah, thanks. And, and so, you know, the way, the way I think about this in, in general terms is that cities, but other sort of at other scales of governance, there's a tension between on the one hand, the need for employers to have an abundant and a relatively cheap labor force, and on the other hand, you can think of it, if you want to use American terminology, as nativism, 
Um, and when I began to think of it in that way, and this was, you know, during the Trump years, it's like, yeah, like the United States government is taking all of these interventions on basically nativist racist terms to deprive employers of workers that they really need, right? I mean, you can't, it, it, it operates at a different scale in the United States, it's much smaller, but if you think about the undocumented workforce in this country, lots of industries, you know, services, uh, restaurants, agriculture, all these domestic workers can't function without, without undocumented workers. And so to the extent that that kind of nativ nativist impulse to, to expel people out of this country is successful, it undermines the economic vitality of the country, which presumably the Republican Party is also concerned with. So I absolutely see this as, as, a, as a bigger um, dynamic, again, between, between these kind of two poles. Um, the thing that is uh, relatively distinctive about China is how important the city is, right? And so in terms of thinking about this as an urbanization problem, cities in China just have much greater capacity to regulate movement of people in and out of their spaces than is the case for, you know, New York City or Chicago or, or what have you. Uh, so, so I do think that that's, that's an um, important distinction. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Friedman, for joining us today and uh, sharing your work with us. Um, I, I want to thank everyone again for um, popping back in <laughs> when we all got kicked out for a second and then joining us for the, the last 15 minutes of Q&A, uh, which are always uh, really enlightening. And, and thanks, thanks to everyone. Um, once again, uh, and I will reshare here the link to our, our next series. So we do have two more in our series of resilient global cities to join us here today um, in October and November. So I'm hoping you can all uh, register and join us again then. Um, and, and once again, big thanks to, to Dr. Friedman uh, for joining us and, and also to Hillary and, and Ellie um, for helping organize uh, the series today. Um, and everyone enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>